Uh, it's spinning. Okay. And it's being. Oh, you're no longer live. Your stream is ended. I'm going to try again. It says you're live and recording now. Oh, it is live and we are recording. I did two, three. Okay, good. Well, we, we, we are live and uh, uh, so we'll just start. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're listening from. Um, thank you for joining our session today. Uh, my name is Robert Kahn and I'm the Brussels based Managing Director for Automated Financial Systems, Inc. Uh, AFS is the leading provider of lending platforms for major banks in the U.S. and globally. Annette Neese, the former cabinet minister for education, science, and culture from uh, the Netherlands, was scheduled to share our session. She's unable to join today, and her voice and insights will be missed. I will therefore serve as both the chair and as a panel member. Uh, and there's much, there's been much success and much hype about the commercialization of innovation in the digital space. Our response to the COVID pandemic has only intensified uh, the digital focus. Today's panel is people by expert across the digital horizon. Each will introduce themselves and provide a short overview, setting the stage for a discussion today, which we would like to be interactive. So. Mike Hoey, if I can throw it over to you to start, and if you can introduce yourself and uh, take about three minutes to set the stage. Thank you. Thanks. Um, my name is Michael Hoey. I'm the owner of Source Meridian. Uh, Source Meridian is a software development shop in South America, um, primarily in Colombia, and most of the work we do is for the life sciences industry um, in the U.S. healthcare. Um, there are yeah, in addition to that, I also founded a, a, a clinical research organization here in Colombia, um, where we've you know been able to participate in some of the research on the COVID vaccines and, and follow up therapies um, of such. Um, yeah, you know, with today's topic, really, I think talking about how innovation gets um, digested by the marketplace and you know, how you get products launched and how you get them accepted and. Um, and there, yeah, I've, I've been in the software business doing that for probably the better part of 30 years. And you know, anyone who's been in that business for a while has probably come across, you know, Jeffrey Moore's books, you know, Crossing the Chasm and the, the follow up to that, where he talks a lot about, you know, this this early adopter to pragmatist to laggard um, sort of psychological profile of different parts of the market and how you get people to accept any kind of innovation and how you really get companies off the ground and products off the ground. Um, I, I think those things are, are still true, um, but we have seen with COVID kind of two places where we had, you know, a disruption to an entire system, which caused new opportunities in innovation. So in my, my clinical research world, we saw MNRA vaccines suddenly become, you know, a, you know, a dominant force in that, in that area. Now, those weren't new. Um, you know, my CRO had been dealing with those for about five years in various stages of early trials. Um, you know, what was new is we suddenly had this event that caused us to accelerate the adoption of that technology very rapidly. In the digital world, um, my clients also saw a version of this where if you look at how life sciences would interact with physicians and, and information delivery, they would send a guy out in a car with a laptop, you know, and, and talk to people and COVID stopped that, you know, so one of the communication paths to physicians and hospitals for, um, you know, for information from the life sciences industry suddenly stopped working for them. And it wasn't that they didn't have digital ways of reaching out to this group, but suddenly they became vastly more important. And you saw, you know, orders of magnitude growth in that area. Um, and innovation really being taken at, a, at, a, at an accelerated rate and a number of companies, you know, coming up and taking advantage of that. So I, I think, you know, as we talk about this today, you know, it's kind of standard innovation life cycle that we see in any technology product and then how that can change with these external events. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, now on you, Boyan. Uh, thank you, Robert. I'm calling to you from the mountains. I'm on the ski vacation now with the family uh, in Bulgaria. So please do excuse my outfit, but we are, we are skiing all day. Uh, me, myself, I was a uh, long years of 
uh, uh, in the banking system as a FX dealer, stock dealer, and more than 10 years in a private equity uh, uh, business. In the meantime, I was uh, advising our uh, deputy prime minister who was responsible for macroeconomic issues uh, in Bulgaria. It was in, in between 2005 and 2009. My topic now is um, I'm trying to to suggest that uh, we are very near to the post money. Post money is a notion which was discovered by me and published in a couple of uh, renowned magazines. Post money means that uh, because of the technological advancement, disrupt, disruptive innovations, most probably in next 10 to 15 years, ultra-rich people would be able to buy additional years of life. But not just uh, to buy a medications, but to buy a guarantee that you will live more than the others. And uh, as a result of that, I do believe that on the market there will be offered so-called by me post assets. With these post assets, fintech industry will deal, fin, fin, uh, fin, fin, fintech industry will offer such a new financial instruments on the market, uh, stock market, and uh, these ultra rich people would be able to buy such a guarantees. Through this, I do believe that in the future, the psychological value of money is not going to diminish as per the value function of Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, but an opposite will go up because through the technological uh, disruption, we would be able to buy the things which are unbuyable as per the Bible. So this is a rather futuristic topic, but anyway, exponential development of the science will lead us uh, to see the explosion of uh, longevity industry, longevity science. And as per many scientists, uh, in next 10 to 15 years, we would be able to buy additional years of life. Thank you. Um. Thank you, Boyan. You've given us something to think about. Can't wait to come back and challenge that a bit. Um, Orlando, you want to follow that, please? Yes. So what we saw during the past two years of the pandemic was that uh, actually this gives us the opportunity to accelerate the innovation in areas like uh, logistics, for instance, which we are very much affected and which we are running smoothly, but on a a very old-fashioned way and now really required to be changed. And uh, this is really now the opportunity to seize um, the next eight years to really try to change together with the uh, technological advancements what is uh, the fundamentals and the underlying um, pieces of, that uh, organize everyday's life today. And uh, I believe that um, we have now, during these eight years, the tremendous opportunity to fulfill a lot of the technological um, promises. Although, of course, now we also get into a post-pandemic world with uh, uh, old uh, uh, with old terrors like uh, what's happening right now in Ukraine, which can, of course, help hold us back again. So uh, it's really. For one side, we, we have really this uh, strong capability of going forward with technology. On the other side, there, there is still the old world <laughs> pulling us back. And <laughs> this is really uh, a strange uh, time to, to, do this, uh, to do this now. But let's, let's seize the opportunity as soon as we, we can do it. Orlando, thank you. Wild cards are always uh, problematic. Um, Rob Atkinson, can you introduce yourself and uh, in, in your theme, please? 
Uh, you're muted, Rob. There, sorry. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. I'm probably I'm a, I'm a different kind of speaker. I'm not in business. I I think about business. I follow business, but I also follow government policy. I run a think tank in Washington D.C. called the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, and uh, we look at uh, emer emerging technologies around the world, and we also look at the public policies that either are going to help them or or, or not. Um, in some places, it seems like it's more than not. Uh, a lot of countries seem to have a aversion to disruptive innovation for a lot of different reasons. Um, but I want to make two main points. One is uh, <clears throat> one of the problems th that I think we think about when it talk when it comes to how do we get innovations into the market is we assume that firms are rational, uh, and we assume that there's very that there isn't. Uh, uh, system interdependencies, what economists would call. And to me, the COVID was the perfect case of that. It, it wasn't as if the technologies that we were using in COVID, the technologies we're all using right now, uh, cloud computing, uh, you know, video conferencing, uh, workflow software, all of these things that enabled us to be able to work from home or work remotely, those were all there. We just weren't using them. And the reason and the reason we weren't using them was this sort of chicken or egg thing. Well, I'm not I don't want to do that because my my customers aren't doing it or uh, my workers don't. And what COVID did was basically shove everybody into this new place where it was like, oh, yeah, this is a useful thing to do. And uh, and and I don't you know, we're not going to go back to that old world. We, we might go back a, a few notches, but we're not going to go back to that old world. And that tells me something that. There are a lot of technologies that have incredible potential, but they're not really being adopted for some of these reasons. Now, um, there's a brand new study from the National Science Foundation that just came out today, and I uh, I thought it was really interesting because um, uh, what it did is it surveyed, it's actually the annual survey of, of you know, tens of thousands of companies. And, and one of the things that it, uh, it asked companies was, are you using artificial intelligence uh, as a production technology? In other words, are you using AI to, to make something good or a service better? And even after all of this, you know, discussion, advocacy, even hype about AI, it turns out that 90% of industries, 90% of firms, excuse me, were not using it. Uh, only, uh, only about 0.4% of these firms were Except said they were using it high use, 1% moderate use, 1.6% low use. Um, so that just tells you that, that there, there's, a, there's a huge array of firms out there that are not taking advantage of, of these technologies. Then when they ask the firms, well, why do you, uh, why do you not take advantage of these technologies? Um, the most common one was uh, they, they said the technology is not applicable to the business. So 48% of firms said that, that AI is not applicable to the business. Um, you know, that may or may not be true. Uh, my, my guess is it's probably in reality not that high. It's that these companies don't just don't think it's applicable. 43% uh, said there were no factors uh, uh, adversely affecting the adoption, but they weren't adopting. Um, and only 5% of the company said it was too expensive. Only 1% said it was uh, it was not mature. Only 1% said there were data challenges. Only 1% said there were skill challenges. Um, so to me, the what that suggests is that there's an enormous amount of opportunity out there and that, and that firms just are laggards. Uh, I, I think as our, our first speaker said, uh, Firms are firms are not at the leading edge of, of taking advantage of all the opportunities that they could. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Rob. Uh, very interesting points. Uh, I'll come back in the questions to what drives um, adoption, because I think that's an interesting point you raised. Um, I want to suggest a link between innovation and the emerging technologies that can drive uh, the transformation of financing the ESG goals. Uh, given the limited time for these initial comments, I'll focus on the role of bank lending uh, for this market. And as we've seen, digital innovation impacts uh, transformation across a wide range of industries and policy goals. Uh, I work at the intersection of ESG and finance. 
And today's financial technology has the potential to optimize, optimize the funding of, uh, of these ESG goals, which many experts suggest will require five to seven trillion annually in finance for the next 30 years. It's, it's a big number. Um, now, at my firm, we transform ESG lending journeys of four partner banks. Our, our digital lending platform provides some interesting topics that I'll mention uh, that are important here. Uh, unlimited configurable data fields to support all the current and future ESG taxonomies. Uh, dynamic pricing for susceptible loans that link interest rates uh, to the loan purpose and performance, such as CO2 reduction. APIs uh, that allow for two-way communication between the lending institutions uh, and ESG indexes uh, for tracking purposes and real-time data capture um, at the transaction level. And that aligns bank lending for both converting green loans into green bonds and security and securities and for public-private partnerships. So key, key questions that I take away from that are, are these technologies available today or are they a future development? How quickly can these technologies be deployed? What are the goals being sought? Uh, does take the technology lead to achieving these goals or does it just address around the edges? Uh, you know, sort of the hype versus the promise. And while I'm looking at that from an ESG and finance perspective, it, it applies to everything that we talked about today and, and, and much more. So I, I'd like to just throw it open to, to comments. And I'm going to suggest that Mike talked about the pace of change. Orlando talked about how wildcards can impact that. And, and Rob talked about what drives adoption, among other things. And uh, Boy, and I'll get back to you. Don't 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 worry. Uh, <laughs> we're talking about Adam and Eve uh, in, in one of these transformation things. It's it's an interesting topic. Um, okay. But you know, let, 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 let's talk about what drives adoption here. What what drives adoption? And I'll throw that out to anybody. Go ahead, Mike. So I I, I think adoption gets driven by, you know, it, it always is going to get driven by need. And then it's always going to be, you know, different groups that perceive need differently. Right. So that one of the examples, you know, we just talked about here was, yeah, you know, we've had this kind of video conferencing around for a while and nobody cared about it three years ago. Um, you know, it, it was, it penetrated, you know, certain small niche markets, you know, where the telepresence was important, right? So, you know, there were guys trying to do this in medicine, um, yeah, but they were held up by some regulatory stuff and some billing stuff. You know, there were people that did this for, you know, kind of personal side more than the business side. And, you know, it took, you know, it took, you know, a forced need of like, hey, you're not allowed to go visit that guy anymore and you still need to go do business. Like, okay, well, I'll go figure out how to download Zoom and, you know, and make sure that my business doesn't go under, you know, so that, that need needs to get communicated and, you know, and obviously, um, you know, there was a social aspect of it too. You know, if I tried to do a video conference three years ago, you know, half my customers would have been like, why don't you just get in your car and drive down here? Yeah. You know? And, um, but as that need became clear, the adoption, you know, ramped faster than anyone could have imagined. And I, you know, it's the job of product guys and to, you know, you know, to leverage messaging to describe, you know, need and solutions in very simple, digestible ways for people to be able to adopt or else you run into, you know, the institutional inertia of, hey, I got something that's working for me now. Why am I taking a risk by trying something new? So the wild card of COVID pandemic uh, forcing everyone to stay at home. So if you wanted to work with your colleagues or work with potential customers, uh, the best way to do that was used to be with a phone call or a letter, then email, and now Zoom, uh, and, uh, you know, some biblical teleporting in the future. No, just, just kidding. Well, and, and, and there was always, you know, the, you know, most businesses are very risk averse. Um, certainly mature businesses, you know, tend to think in terms of, of, of risk there. And, you know, before, 
COVID, you know, your risk was if you suggested a video conference instead of an in-person meeting, yeah, your risk not looking serious. And then that went away. Yeah, and then if you didn't adopt this, your risk was your business was going to be gone. Yeah, so the, the equation flipped. Um, suddenly the risk model flipped and, yeah, we have a new way that we all go to work. So Wildcard both drive innovation and the adoption and also slow the adoption depending upon what that wall card is and how. Yeah, if the new technology is perceived as riskier, the larger organizations aren't going to adopt. Unless right? they have to. Yeah, you know, and larger organizations adopt when they see their peers adopting. Um, yeah, so that's, you know, the, there is the conundrum to, you know, the innovator that's trying to get something in there is how do you get one of those pragmatist organizations to adopt so that their friends see it as safe? Um, I, I want to throw something over to you, Orlando. Because uh, your business fascinates me. Um, we've had such disruption to supply chains for based on the way globalization was structured. And, and your company is using technology to disrupt the historic way that we've done supply chain. So what do you see technology achieving on supply chains to make it better than what we have today to uh, avoid such disruptions in the future. Where are we going? Yeah. So with current technology, we are currently able to already foresee demand and also to to improve the fulfillment. So basically, if we see that uh, over one trillion US dollars in, in food is uh, wasted every year in the global supply chains uh, by employing AI, machine learning and uh, real-time data coming from um, uh, sensors, we can actually avoid this, uh, uh, this enormous amount of, uh, of uh, waste to be created. And we can actually already feed 2 billion people just using um, available technology as of today. This is really one of the great advantages of having machine learning at a very, uh, at a very or economically very, uh, very simple uh, simple infrastructure-based uh, services available. Now, Orlando, what... successfully doing that, um, you know, uh, solves one of the biggest problems. It's how do you get that that food or that good where it's needed, when it's needed, particularly if it's perishable. Yes. Yes, uh, what we can achieve with that is basically that we really are capable of selling in the most indicated market the, the, the food before it uh, perishes. There, there's no need for bananas to be transported from Ecuador all the way to Poland if we already know in Rotterdam that they will not get to Poland on time. So those need to be sold in the local, in the local markets uh, where it is uh, uh, where it is. Uh, Offloaded, and uh, new uh, new orders need to be um, automatically generated uh, for the for the original market. So, by having uh, machine learning networks which are capable of uh, creating this uh, optimization on a global basis, we are capable of uh, distributing the the agricultural products to the markets where they can be easily. Uh, be sold. This uh, also reduces the uh, the cost of goods for developing markets because th there are no orders from uh, from European or U.S. markets just because uh, we didn't get the bananas on time in the in the right uh, condition. This uh, mean, uh, means that local markets will be able to to get more affordable food as well, and uh, this without having to to waste additional arable land or, or water to, to produce them. So it's really a optimization on a global scale with perfect, uh, um, with perfect um, information capabilities. And, and, and what's, the, what's the uptake uh, from different stakeholders in uh, wanting to commercialize and deploy that technology? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, as of today, we, we know that, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the largest uh, truck manufacturers worldwide, they are interested in this kind of models. The same happens as well with, uh, with large retailers, which uh, are ordering 
are doing this uh, perishable goods on a, a, a huge scale. So the, the stone is already rolling. Uh, we believe that uh, the more people and companies we onboard into this system, the easier it will get for the next entrance to get into it. So it is a, a self-fulfilling promise. The more uh, customers are onboarded on, onto this system, which we call the Internet of Cargo, the, the more easily it will get uh, to really use and fulfill this promise. Uh, I, I would love to talk more about this, but we, we, we have to expand. I'm, I, I, like all of us, uh, I've been impacted by disruption, su disrupted supply chains uh, globally. Mm -hmm. And so I really do have a question about, you know, uh, whether we want to buy locally, sell locally, or if the uh, world economy can still be as global as it was before the pandemic. But we'll come back to that. Yeah. Um, I, you know, can I throw out something that uh, Boyan uh, talked about? And, and, and it's the concept of equity. Um, you know, it, it was, we talked about ESG goals. There's, you know, a lot of, uh, of disruption. Uh, there's, a, a, you know, the, in, in the Philadelphia area, the life cycle is 20 years, depending on zip code or postal code. You can have a 21, a 20 years uh, difference between two different parts of center city, Philadelphia. And, and, and Mike would understand that. And, you know, they could be uh, all of two kilometers separating these two areas in the life of 20 years. So equity is 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 pretty important topic. Um, now, boy, and you're suggesting uh, the use of technology to really disrupt the concept of equity where super rich people can live 20 years longer. Um, how do others people see how, do, how does the panel see technology uh you know, transformation, driving this a goal that many of us have to uh, have better equity in health outcomes, better equity in lifestyle and opportunity uh, is what's the role for technology in this? And, you know, um, <clears throat> um, Rob, since you uh, have a leading organization where you've got a, a top Democratic senator from the great state of Delaware on your board, and one of the uh, leading Republicans uh, from the minority state of California, uh, from Congress, uh, from uh, as a House of Rep a House representative on your board, uh, you know, you, you, from a policy perspective, you're getting all sides. Where do you, where do you see this? Where does where do your uh, member organizations uh, see this going? Yeah. So, I, I mean, yeah, technically we don't have member organizations because we're a think tank, but I think okay, sorry. <laughs> there's a lot of. Uh, People over there are people, particularly on the left, who want to overstate the negative impact of technological innovation on equity and opportunity, and I think that's a that's a very dangerous path to go down. Um, and that's not to say that there aren't things that we should be focused on. For example, in the U.S., the Congress just passed a major broadband bill that'll help low-income people afford broadband. Absolutely great. One of the things we've proposed is is, is a notion called data equity. Uh, right now, they're on. You know, if you're a higher income neighborhood or a higher income person, the, the data economy is going to be stronger for you because there's just more data. So there are things the government can do there. But I think one of the things we have to understand is if you look at the role of, excuse me, if you look at the uh, wage growth over the last 20 years, it's been not that good for most people because productivity growth has been slow. And I think we can't lose sight of the fact that these, all these technologies we're talking about here particularly uh, what, what some people call the fourth industrial revolution, which I hate that term, but it's, you know, it's AI, it's autonomous systems, it's, it's uh, sensors, 5G, et cetera. That is going to boost productivity, I believe. And I think one of the challenges, though, is take up. Um, I go back to that NSF study where 60% uh, of American, American firms that were surveyed for R&D don't use the cloud. I'm like, I don't know, maybe that's that 20 year thing you're talking. I don't know, what are these, what, what are these companies doing? We're, we have 28 people in our organization. We've been, our, we've been totally cloud-based for six years. Uh, it's so much better, it saves us money. So if a little organization like us can do it, I just, to me, there's something, 
we're, we're really have we and I assume this is true in other in Europe and other other places around the world where you just companies should be adopting these a lot faster. In another issue, we, we just we just the, the last couple of months, we adopted this new uh, HR platform uh, you know, you, you you put your vacation thing in there and it tells you how much your 401k is all that. I'm like, why didn't we have that five years ago? And, and I think the answer is because we didn't, it wasn't good enough five years ago. It wasn't easy to use five years ago. And now somebody, some vendor, super easy to use, super easy to install. So I, I do think some of it's just that. Um, but, you know, when you, when you think about these technologies that we use as a small organization, 30 years ago, it was harder for us to would have been harder for us to do that because we would have had to custom design our own software. And so I do think that that's at least an equalizing force in terms of small versus big. Uh, th thanks, Rob. Uh, boy, and I want to throw a couple of things that Rob just said over you. Uh, one with your former hat uh, of looking at uh, you know financial and economic situations uh, for, with, for the government in um, Bulgaria. Um, I think it's much harder for regulated industries uh, like banking, finance, uh, healthcare to um, be comfortable with migrating to certain technologies like the cloud uh, when they're so regulated and they're fearful of getting out of their own data center. It's, it's progressing. So I'd, I'd like you to talk about that. And, and, and then I would like to throw over the, the equity uh, comment to yourself because um, you're suggesting something that reeks of, uh, you know, favoritism for a, a class of people called super rich. But could you do both those? Um, uh, look, uh, let me let me try with this. Uh, the, the longevity science and the fintech industry is not going to ask at all the banking system and the healthcare system whether they do agree with the dis disruptive technologies and with the disruptive uh, uh, innovations. Let me just give you an example. At the beginning of 20th century, the average lifespan was around 45, 47. Now the average lifespan is around 85, 87. And still, the life cycle investment objectives are absolutely the same. The asset classes in which you can invest are absolutely uh, the same. Probably uh, the, the newest one is, uh, are, are the, the cryptocurrencies. So uh, the technologies uh, in the future will absolutely destroy the asset management uh, industry and the banking uh, system industry we know right now because artificial intelligence will be employed for the ultra rich people to make them such a medications uh, nano robots etc or to guarantee to them say 15 or 20 years more and then it might pose a problems within the societies because if now say i'm driving a uh, citroen you might drive a Ferrari. It doesn't make a, 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 a big change, a big difference. But at certain day, if you would be able to buy a 20 years more, you will, you, you will be half a god. And I am not going to be a half a god. So during that time, there will be a societal, cultural, and philosophical problem. And this problem we have to, uh, to, to try to solve now and discuss now because uh, last year we were not discussing the uh, Mr. Putin and uh, in 2008 when I was a representative of my government I, I told in US that still we are in a cold war and during that time they told me ah oh, boy and you are so psychological damaged because you were living under the communists so many years but you know, we, you see what we have. So I know my topic is a little bit crazy. It's a futuristical, but uh, the exponentiality of the uh, of the science will give the possibility to enhance to extend the human lives, and we have to try to cope with this uh, 
innovation before? Uh, Wayne, I just want to say one thing. There, there were several of us in, in the U.S. and other European countries who understood who Mr. Putin was. And uh, myself and a lot of people from where Mike lives, Philadelphia, were very supportive of Boris Nimsov from uh, the early part of the 1990s and brought him to Columbia to study and supported him. And, you know, the world would have been a different place if um, when Yeltsin had the choice after three failed PMs, if he had gone with Nimsov rather than Mr. Putin. Uh, but I'll, I'll leave that aside uh, for now. We can have that a discussion with uh, Jamie Firestone and some other people uh, when we get together. Um, would someone like to ask, comment on what Boyan said or ask any of us a question? Because I've been uh, driving this and I, I want to give each of you or any of you a chance to ask a question, make a comment, uh, say what you want. We, we've got nine minutes. I mean, I have one question for Boyan, I guess. is I agree with you that life extension is, is going to be a big deal. Um, I guess my question would be, in a lot of these technological areas, the initial, you know, products are expensive. And then, and, and then uh, as you, as you gain market share and market size, excuse me, prices come down and, and then they become more affordable. Um, do you see that happening in this space or do you see it as kind of continually uh, kind of only an elite consumption item? Uh, um, look, uh, Rob, uh, thanks for your question. Uh, let me tell you that right now, uh, probably 10 to 15 percent of the asset management is made by robo advisors. It's uh, the trend since last probably 10 years. Uh, I do believe that into the future, uh, these robo advisors will create the base for the post assets which will be sold to the people rich people who can extend their lives uh it's uh, going to be an inevitable mega trend because we don't have nothing more precious than our lives and that is why uh, the, the, the scientific research from the last 10 years is nearly uh, uh, is saying that it's not just plausible, but it's probable that we would be able to uh, extend uh, our lives. And during that time, most probably there will be a, a certain political problem, say, uh, in the states in between Democrats and Republicans uh, are able to buy additional years of uh, lives and etc. And, and cetera, et cetera. But the most important thing is that, uh, listen, uh, for me, it's very hard to prove my post-money theory. I just published one article, but anyway, I'm coming from a small country. I'm, I'm not from a big country. And if you would believe that you can help me to to, uh, to 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 raise the voice about that theory I, I would be really really very very grateful because I do believe it's interesting and important thing. I don't know whether I, I was good in answering uh, uh, your question uh, uh, Rob yeah yeah thank you yeah um, Mike we, we've gotten away from uh, vaccine development and <laughs> all the insights you can share. Uh, maybe they do get a buoyant point in the future, but if you wanna, what would you like to share? Well, so we, we were talking earlier about, you know, discontinuity and health outcomes just based on zip codes, right? You know, you know yeah. two, two mile difference in Center City and you have a 20 year difference in lifespan. So, you know, one of my clients actually spends a lot of time studying that, um, you know, looking at you know, longitudinal claims data and understanding these things. And, you know, what you find is that you know, there are things that affect outcomes and chance of, you know, developing different conditions later in life. Um, and not all of them are controllable, right? So, you know, the ones that are controllable are, you know, are exercise and diet and stress and things like that. But you can't control your genetics and you can't control the exposures early in life. 
right? So a lot of the, you know, a lot of the, you know, the, the reasons that you find in the data um, and, and in the literature for that big disparity in outcomes based on, you know, the zip code you were born in, um, it winds up coming down to those early exposures. Um, you know, that, you know, if you're in one part of Philadelphia, you know, you're, you're in center city, um, you know, you're, yeah, you're getting exposed to a little bit of smog, but mostly you're fine. If you're in another part of Philadelphia, you know, you've got factories and, you know, all sorts of contamination all around you that is just building up, um, in your early years. And you know, that, that part of your fate is hard to change. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's similar to like, you can't change your genetics. You can't change those exposures. Um, and then really, how do you get, how do you have people understand what they can affect later in life? And then as that loops back to the sort of, you know, politics of buying more years of your life, um, you know, it's interesting. I mean, you know, you see life expectancy fluctuate in the States right now, um, you know, has a lot more to do sort of economic opportunity, um, than everything else, you know, all the diseases of despair. Mike, I, I, I want to uh, riff on that for a minute. So I'm married to one of the thought, leading thought leaders in the U.S. on the social determinants of health, and, and they are so important to, to getting things done. But if we go back to technology, technology can positively impact uh, some of those social determinants. Someone talked about getting the last kilometer, or last mile uh, of high net Internet connection into, into homes, into communities. That, that changes the social determinants of health in a, in, in a meaningful way. And we can go on and on with how technology can uh, be a positive, uh, you know, change in uh, equity uh, and, and that creates, you know, real positive GDP for the country, but makes a you know, constructive uh, impact on the life of the individual. And I think that's the promise uh, yeah. the, the challenge is there's a lot of hype out there. So if you look at uh, health tech right now, what what money, what venture money is getting thrown at so many ideas and, and what is the goal? What is the real impact? So how we uh, thread that needle uh, is is going to be so and, significant and, and, and getting and the, the outcomes. The social part is fascinating because you can sort of start to see, okay, here here's a contributor to this bad outcome and then – all right, now what do you do about it? How do you remediate that, right? Mm -hmm. That's the, the big challenge. So the social determinants help you figure out, okay, here's the problem. You know, here are the things contributing and then remediation. Um, we were doing analysis again with one of my clients on, um, you know, a, a, an odd aspect of social determinants of health, but, you know, how does your, you know, your economics and, um, you know, your education and your race affect whether you're going to get a script that a doctor wrote for you? Oh, it's um, huge. It, it is just huge. Uh, hey, we've got two minutes left. Uh, I want to interrupt us. I want to thank everyone for their contribution. Uh, uh, you know, I look forward to following up with each of you. Uh, but if you could take 30 seconds to sum up, and, and, and I'm going to start with Orlando uh, and go to Rob and go to Boyan. And it might, if you and I don't get in, that's we don't get in. Uh, so Orlando, can you say 30 seconds Yes, yes. Uh, I'm very upbeat regarding the possibilities of uh, technology to bring us further. And uh, I believe a lot of people are really engaged now to make this happen. Uh, I hope that we really use the upcoming eight years in the best fashion and uh, really bring humanity forward instead of uh, tripping on our own feet. Well said. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, look, I think um, one of the challenges, I think Mike said this, uh, pe people look to others before they adopt. And it, it's actually there's a term for that called the penguin effect. Uh, the penguin don't jump in until the first one jumps. Um, I think one of the things that we need to think more about is how the government can play a role in that as a lead adopter. For example, you look in the in, when COVID happened and there was this big rush on unemployment insurance um, state websites and most of them crashed. Believe it or not, most of them were not cloud based. I mean, Think about that for a moment. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So governments need to at least get up to some level of competency and adoption in these areas. And I do think that would help everybody sort of avoid the penguin effect. Great. Uh, Blaine, last word to you. 
Uh, we have to be aware of uh, exponentiality of the science as it was written by uh, Kurzweil. And we have to be aware uh, of that, that uh, uh, technological qualitative change can be our friend, but at the same time, it can be our, uh, our biggest enemy if it will achieve to divide our societies. It doesn't matter whether societies are in Europe or in US or in Africa. And that is why, to me, it's very important we to try to look uh, to post money idea and post money assets because this is a qualitative psychological change of experiencing of the money into the future. Thank you, uh, Mike. I'm going to cut you and I off, but I, I really appreciate everyone's you know effort and, and contribution today. Look forward to meeting each of you maybe next year uh, in person. Uh, be great. Have a great reference of conference. Good day, guys. Thank you. Cheers. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Stay fit. Bye-bye.